The month of October, you're welcome to our Independence Month. As you can see, we have mounted the flag and this month we hope to uh, tell you guys what each color on the flag means. Every color and every symbol on our Zambian flag means something. Republic of Zambia, we're proud to be Zambian and we are proud to bring you this Zambian show. So a couple of announcements for you guys uh, concerning the show. Remember last week I told you we'll be giving a couple of announcements. Um, exciting stuff coming up. This is the last uh, episode that we're airing at 15 hours. Uh, today we're having Bible Talks. So this is the last episode we're airing at this time. Uh, if you have been following the show from the beginning, we started out by uploading content randomly and then we shifted to uploading content at 12 hours Central African time. And then we set days, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then we shifted to 15 hours Central African time, uh, maintain the days, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. But now we are kind of officially launching the show uh, for its intended um, intended purpose, for what we intended for the show to be. There's a lot of things we've been doing in the background in terms of working on trying to set up and whatnot, and we've completed a lot of that stuff. And so now we are about to get into it full gear. And so we are thankful to you for supporting us so far in terms of your subscriptions and your likes and your shares and your comments, everyone that has been uh, there to support and to watch. Um, we're thankful and everyone that has been there to admire the new hair. <laughs> anyway, so uh, first announcement, we are shifting the show from 15 hours to 20 hours. Uh, which means uh, the show will air every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 20 hours. Um, and the show is no longer just going to be a podcast, but a late night show. So we are introducing to you Amazing Minds, Zambia's first late night show. Secondly, uh, we are introducing a co-host on the show. So I know we've had a co-host on the Rebato Suilanji, who will still be um, appearing on the show every other week. But we are now introducing a more permanent co-host who will be here on the Monday shows and on the Wednesday shows. And we are introducing a second chair. So what we had for second chair, where the guests usually sit, is going to be third chair. Now third chair is for the guests. If you understand late night, then you understand third chair is the guest chair. Second chair is uh, the co-host chair. And he'll be coming in this coming Monday. This is when we are launching uh, or starting out as a late night show. Yes, so uh, we introduced another chair, we are bringing in a co-host and we're switching the time to uh, 20 hours, which is making it a late night comedy show. So we're maintaining political commentary, educative content and Christian content. Monday is going to still, is still going to be rather a political segment. We'll discuss politics in terms of what's going on in the news and we'll give political commentary. We'll have guests come in that will give us informative uh, conversations in line with uh, political commentary and uh, whatever they have to say. Wednesdays are no longer going to be strictly rebuttals. Uh, rebuttals are something special to me. This is one of the first videos I put out. If you have followed the channel, then you'll notice that one of my first videos was a rebuttal on who Lenshina was. So Wednesdays will no longer just be rebuttals. It will be an educative segment, which means we'll do history, we'll do um, uh, educative discussions, we'll do various kinds of content on Wednesday, which uh, which all fall under educative content, which will also include rebuttals. So the Wednesday segment is uh, again airing uh, 20 hours, just like every other segment, and Friday is being maintained as Bible Talks. Today's Bible Talks will be an example of the kind of content we expect to air out on Fridays. Very educative, informative, and spiritually building content on Bible Talks. We are going to answer some of your deep spiritual questions, and we are going to also share uh, from the wealth of, wealth of knowledge that our guests and the hosts have on the show. So again, if you're uh, new to the show, we are welcoming you and we are introducing to you Amazing Minds, Zambia's first late night show. On with the show. Switch my heart and do you, you will find It's love for you All I got is love for you It's oh, been yeah. a while Actually, I uh, missed you guys 
<laughs> Believe it or not. No, no, no for we, real. Like, we missed you. You know, I've been, I, I've been. I loved uh, our last show. It was fun. Oh, really? Yeah. You know what I loved more? Our conversation outside. Ah, yes. Oh, that was. And I, I feel this where we're going into now? Yeah, this is where we're going into now. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome to the show. Uh, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Hit that notification bell and share. I am here with Reverend Mombazi today. We're doing Bible Talks. Uh, Mondays are for political discussions, Wednesdays are for rebuttals, and Fridays are for Bible Talks. If you're not subscribed, once again, please do subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share. The show is in your hands. If you don't subscribe, <laughs> huh? Rev, tell them. <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, if you don't subscribe, Dan doesn't get the numbers. And Dan, if Dan doesn't get the numbers, well, the channel doesn't generate money. And if it doesn't generate money, he'll have to shut down. Niche so, company, Kwisa. Yeah, so he needs the numbers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we all need the numbers. We all need the numbers. You're welcome, Rev. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan. Thank we're you so we're pleased to have you here. Today, we'll be discussing the pre Adamic world, as you can see from the title, a very strange topic. For some of you, I'm sure you're here just to judge the doctrine and whatnot. Uh, the Adventists of this world, and they, <laughs> I, I was I was doing a rebuttal not too long ago on whether Christians should eat pork. Wow, <laughs> I can imagine. You should have seen the responses I got. Yeah, because you know there's that whole thing about Jesus, and so with Jesus, and and the whole uh, experience of Peter on the on the rooftop. Oh yeah. yeah so, so but yeah. you know, uh, funny enough, here's my take on it. Yeah. All. All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. For me, that's always the scripture that should work as a gauge. Yes. So, so yes, in Christ, we have liberty in terms of what we eat, in terms of what we can do within the confines of good moral standing. But then some things, though permitted, if you go into the study and the depth and the history of why it became law, you'll actually discover that there was a lot of science which was just not explained. And, and, and pork is one of those. I mean, look, you can eat all the meat you want, but I know as a health um, enthusiast yeah. that uh, animal protein is just generally not the healthiest source of protein, really. Have you heard if of... You, if you had to go deep into, into, into the science. Into and the of science. course, with pork, there's a whole thing to pork. So, so that's, <laughs> that's another topic right They used there. to threaten us, if you eat pork, don't you know that when you pour uh, lemon on Coca pork, Coca -Cola. Uh, or Coca-Cola, whatever it was, worms come out. <laughs> I know. But look, the bottom line, Dad, is that uh, it's, it, there, there is legitimacy to the concerns for health when it comes to animal fat, uh, protein and yeah. animal fat. There is legitimacy to the arguments. Have you heard but all of the things carnivore taken... diet though? Huh? Have you heard of the carnivore diet? Mm -mm, I haven't heard. Oh, the one where you just eat Meat. proteins alone, yeah, meats. Just, just meat, no, no vegetables. The no... challenge, yes, true. I mean, being a diet, but the challenge is, is meat is the hardest to digest in the body, even when cooked. It, it takes the longest to digest because it's got no fiber. Yeah. So it stays longest in the alimentary canal. It has been proven to produce a lot of by, byproducts, which are pretty much lousy for the body, highest of which is uric acid. And so if you combine it with uh, carbonated drinks, yeah. whether alcoholic Ooh, or non-alcoholic, terrible combination, because <laughs> that leads to all sorts of things, gout and all sorts of things. It's, it's just not, there's just way more problems with animal fat than there is without it. So if it's taken in moderation, I always remember we used to have this, Plate theory, right? Yeah. Quarter veggies, uh, sorry, half of veggies, quarter of carbohydrates, and quarter of protein or meat. Ah, so, okay. so, so you have more, more greens or more veggie, especially food that's high in um, in fiber, and then even your your carbohydrates. The the less processed, the better. So, if you try and stick to the mgaiwa and the you know the the, the millet and things like that, mm. that's much much healthier. And if you go for the super processed uh, starch, you know, the, the yeah. high protein starch, especially breakfast meal, meal. That's why that's why that stuff never goes bad. Try putting it out there and just leave it for one year. It's still fine when you find it. You'll never say the same for roll out or any of these other meals. Yeah. They, they actually go bad within days. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Like especially mm. millet. Yeah. That's why it's very difficult to find it in the shops because yeah. it goes bad. Mm. If, if, if you have to make it store that long, it means you have to get rid of what makes it healthy. 
Mm, yeah, mm. so you get rid of what makes it. So that's why it's it's just it's like that. Uh, that that's the whole essence of processed foods. To that's get right. to get rid of what makes it healthy. Mm-hmm. In order to make <laughs> in it order stay to on make the shelf it stay longer, longer and or so taste better. You know what I mean. And mm. unfortunately, that's what leads to all these. I think the prevalence of cancers today can be attributed in a in a large extent to processed food and lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. So 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 the lifestyle we live nowadays is really messed. And that definitely contributes. I mean, never in history have we seen more diabetes, hypertension, you know, cancers. All these yeah, things are coming yeah. up. And, and for me, I attribute it to food because of urbanization. So food has to be stored longer on shelves. We're not eating directly from the earth. We're eating through processed yeah. uh, food. And that's, that's just not good. And funny enough, they're adding sugar to almost everything yes. now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know why? <laughs> yeah. Because, be, because that helps to store the food longer. Ah, uh, yep, yep, okay. Yep. Also, so, sugar is like a preservative. Yeah, especially when it's the white, deadly sugar, yes. <laughs> deadly. <laughs> white and deadly. <laughs> the white and the deadly. Oh, no, now we may never get a sponsorship from Zambia Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. No, they'll take it, take it in moderation. But they do have that uh, nice dark brown sugar. That's very, very healthy. The darker, the better. Oh, wait, it's also, uh, so the, the brown sugar is actually healthy. Than the white sugar, absolutely. So and it's, then the it's dark, not healthy, it's healthier. It's healthier, of course, it's, just not healthy, <laughs> but it's healthier. But there's yeah. that dark one, the one that hardens, the one ah. that smells like molasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the healthiest. That's rare to find, actually. No, it's there, it's there. It's ah. just people don't buy it because it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. You see, that's the that's the cue right there. The healthier, the, the more, more expensive. Yeah, it's like looking for extra virgin olive oil. There you go. The healthier, the more expensive. It's that's like... Right. Uh, only the, the top 1% should survive. Correct. Yeah, which, <laughs> which is really another topic. We should be call me back for that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> call me back for that one. There's a lot in that. <laughs> but yeah, 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 true, yeah. true, true. Anyway, so uh, Adam, our mm-hmm. father. Mm-hmm. You know, interesting enough, the Bible says, and God created man in his image and likeness, male and female, he created them, and he called him Adam. Yes. So... God created the human race and called the human race Adam. Mm -hmm. And everyone came out of Adam. Now, what happened before Adam? Have you guys noticed that the enemy was already on earth by the time Adam was being created? That's why Adam was told to subdue the earth. As a matter of fact, um, the enemy seemed to know things already about the trees in the garden. Um, I want to, I want us to focus on one scripture, which is going to be what what I can call the preamble or introduction into the subject today about the pre-Adamic world. I know Rev has a wealth of knowledge on this particular subject, and this is a subject of interest for me. Uh, I want us to focus on Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-eight, that says, uh, "I'm paraphrasing: Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth." I hope I got that correct. Well, there's five five uh, mandates there. Yeah, so uh, my focus is on replenish. That's right. Replenish the earth. Why did, you know, interesting enough, uh, side thought. Have you noticed that this commandment, which was the very, very, very first commandment God gave of the, of the five mandates, yeah, the five mandates, be fruitful. Yes. It was the first commandment he gave when he made Adam. It was the first commandment he gave when he made uh, Eve. It was also the first commandment he gave when he made, or rather after the after the flood, mm. be fruitful, be fruitful. And interesting enough, it's the same thing that Jesus says in John 15, when he says, I am the vine, you're the branches, and every branch- that are connected to me, bear yes, fruit. Yes, bear fruit. <clears throat> so this being fruitful means so much more than we may have thought. Anyway, that was a side thought. Mm. God instructed Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. This was the same instruction that he gave to Noah. Now, we understand in Noah's case why God would have told him to replenish. To replenish simply means to fill again. If something was full, it has become empty, fill it again. And this was the instruction that God gave to Adam, interesting enough. So then what happened for God to give Adam that instruction? Was the world once full? Rev. Right. So You are the reverend. Yeah, well, well, well. <laughs> but yeah. besides just being a reverend, I have a lot of interest in this subject. Yeah. And we'll be going in some very strange terrain, so please... 
buckle up and wear your seatbelt and uh, re and make sure you keep the seatbelt on unless uh, otherwise. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and please remember to put your phones on airplane mode yep, so that yep, you don't yep. disturb the navigation equipment <laughs> as we fly. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> so anyway, so first things first, before I begin <clears throat> to propound on this very exciting topic, which again, by the way, yeah. interestingly, you know, uh, Dan, I was amazed as a Bible student yeah. to learn that in Bible school, there are certain topics that are not really favored. Uh, maybe, maybe let me focus on Pentecostal charismatic Bible schools, but they're, yeah. they're topics that they warn not to really talk about. One of them is eschatology. Yeah. And then the other one is this very one. <laughs> the two most problematic books, and this is just in terms of their interpretation as, uh, and it's uh, exegetical or, or what we call, um, what's that word? So the word has gone, where, when, when you do, so some things, you know, when you're breaking down the Bible as a term, it's just gone when you preach using line by line and then- Is it isoge- iso- No, there's, there's exegesis, but there's another term. Uh, so, so something study of the Bible, breakdown, anyway, the word has gone. Okay. Ish, I can't believe. So anyway, these two books are, are, are a clear do not tamper. Do not go there because they are very problematic. And that, that is the book of Revelation yeah. and the book of Genesis. So oh. these two books are notoriously... <laughs> Interesting. Ooh. Notoriously. I wish I had popcorn. You know what I mean? <laughs> they are notorious to, to, to speak about, especially the first five chapters. In fact, you know what? Let's just go all the way to this. Right up to chapter, chapter nine. In fact, essentially from chapter 11, it gets easier. Because that's when now Abraham is called. Yes. So all these 10 going back. All the way to problems. Babel. Yo, nightmare. <laughs> and you are warned because every one of this is a Pandora's box. Yeah. You, you go into there. All you need is just a shop guy in this audience. And they throw two, three questions. And it's a spanner in the works. You're, you're not going to answer unless you're very versed and familiar. So even as we begin this topic about the pre-Adamic race, let me start by doing two things. Number one, disclaimer. In my narration, I may quote non-canonical books. So I want it out there that I am uh, from the school that believes the Bible is the inerrant, accurate, timeless word of God. So let's just get that out there so, yeah. so that we, 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 we are all on the same page because there are those who have issues with the Bible and they have all sorts of arguments, but they are lame. They fall apart. And, and I've done like deep study on how we got our Bible. Forget yeah. about whatever people tell you about King James and all that rubbish about the Nicene uh, conference. That, that, that's, that's very lame, shallow, very, very hopeless arguments because believe me, if the Bible wasn't what it says it is, this book would have been history today. Yeah. It would not be able to stand the kind of scientific scrutiny we have now. Even for the last 200 years, mm. there's been serious challenges against <sighs> scripture oh, for, for, in terms of its truth, in terms of its veracity, in terms of its accuracy, and the claims it makes about it. Because there's no book out there that makes some gargantuan claims that the Bible does, you know, yeah, the yeah. Bible makes serious claims serious about claims. itself. Exactly. For one, it says it's the word of God. That, <laughs> that alone is a massive claim, you know what I mean? So, the word so, of God. So it's the word of God, like really how, you know, so. It, it so goes that, to the extent of saying, and the word was God. You know what I mean? So that's a serious <laughs> claim. Yeah. So it makes some mad claims. And so there's been people throughout antiquity who've tried to disprove it. So I'm from that group. It is the word of God. So having said that, yeah. we've got these other books, which uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, Hebrew or what you call Jewish uh, tradition are called the pseudepigrapha. These, these are pseudepigrapha. These are the extra books yeah. that were, they did not make it into the compilation we have today uh, of the Protestant books, mm -hmm. but were considered also serious enough to be read in the synagogue and taught in Jewish culture. Okay. So, so, so these pseudepigraphers include Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, uh, Ecclesiasticus, and of course, the Book of Enoch. <laughs> Do you know, interesting <laughs> enough, I've heard mm. of these Maccabees. Uh, oh, powerful books. Um, Serious. I, I know they are read in the Catholic Church. 
Yes, yes. But some I'm, of them, not all. The Book of Enoch is not except read. except for yes. Enoch, which is very interesting. Um, but I've, I've never bothered to actually read these books. No, I have because of my scholarly nature, because I mm. need to understand and I needed to understand why they were excluded. So there's very good reason for their exclusion. Yeah. But it's not, to be honest with what I know, especially some of the books like the Book of Enoch. Yeah. I dare say that that book was preserved by God for this time because it's too deep. Yeah. The things that that book reveals are mind blowing. Yeah. And it is the only book and by consequence, Judaism is the only religion that does not paint the age of the gods as being a utopia. Mm. Instead, it, every other religious book out there, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita, whether it's the Sanskrit writings, whether it's the Mesopotam, uh, Mesopotamian writings of the Akkadians, whether it's the Egyptian for, and, and, uh, and uh, Kemet writings, uh, whether it's the Mayan, Incas, and Aztec writings of mm. South America, whether it's the African traditional stories that we find around the narration of those days when the gods came on the earth, every single one of these narrations paints a utopia. Mm. Only Enoch, paints the opposite. Yeah. Says it was not a utopia. It was corruption. It was evil. It was terrible. It was an abomination. Mm. Only the Judaism faith does that. That's very interesting. Yeah. So so the contrast is 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 stark. I guess it also in that case would align with Genesis itself. Yes. Yeah. In fact, there are lines within the book of Enoch that are literally you can go like word for word straight from Enoch. Yeah, like and Genesis I know the, 6, the book of Jude 4. as well. It says yes, Enoch it, prophesied. It quotes Enoch. In fact, look, the New Testament, three apostles quote Enoch. Enoch, yeah. Uh, Peter Jude, well, right? yes, Jude, Peter, and Paul. Yeah. They quote Enoch. So if, if the early church was quoting Enoch and reading out of Enoch, if the Ethiopian Coptic church had a preserved copy of the book of Enoch, why is it missing in Christendom? But that's not our topic today. I just wanted you to know that I am a God guy. <laughs> like yeah, the yeah, book, yeah. the Bible is the word of God and is indisputably so. Yeah. And so when I quote from books like Enoch, I am doing extra biblical quoting. So we cannot take that as, you know, fact, yeah. as, 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 as the word of God, but we can take it as historical account, yeah. just like Maccabees can be taken as historical account because that was the, the wars between the Jewish, um, uh, what were they called, uh, zealots yeah. against the Roman establishment. So there were quite a number. The group from which Simon um, and uh, Jude, uh, Judas is carried, yeah. those were zealots. Okay. So these these guys were freedom fighters. If we had to use the term today, they would be freedom fighters. If they we had to use the term today, world. they would be terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, they were, yeah, because yeah, yeah. they were fighting for the freedom of, of Israel from the Roman establishment. So when Jesus shows up, these two guys are like, hey, this is the Messiah. Ah, so politically, we need to be part of this guy. I understand. Uh -huh. ah, I see now. You, you know what, Rev? We need Ooh. to do a segment later on in the future on Jesus' political assignment. Correct. A lot of Christians out there have no idea that Jesus actually has a political, a political assignment. assignment. Oh, they, they look at Jesus as a spiritual figure. I, I guess that's why it's a bit hard for them to think of Jesus as a person. Yes. Yeah. And that's something that John was tackling because you see, the, the Apostle John had uh, noticed that, uh, in fact, not just the Apostle John, but the entire New Testament church had noticed that a good number of Gnostics were joining the faith. And yeah. so Gnostics have the general view that all things created are evil. And so you have to transcend and all that stuff. <laughs> and so the idea of God becoming flesh was ridiculous. So, so that was really becoming like, so, so this is why John comes and strongly says that anyone who says that Jesus did not come in the flesh is of Antichrist, ah. blah, 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 blah. So he, he was basically trying to deal with the So Gnostics. these things have historical yes they always have a <laughs> historical context sometimes in in interpreting scripture and understanding it we forget the historical context for example yeah. one of my favorite examples is the argument why women should not speak in church it, it, if you do not look at the historical context of that verse yeah. you take it as gospel and then you bring about this idea that women can't preach which is completely ridiculous yeah and but but when you go into the historical background of that you discover that Corinth was at the heart and center of Roman pagan worship in which women were temple prostitutes and women mm. many women were prophetesses 
Mm. That's why the slave girl of Act 16 yeah, yeah. is such a big deal. Yeah. Because these were operating under a very powerful spirit called the Pythian spirit, which was of Greco origin. So, so Greco Roman origin. And you can get an idea of that by going into the movie 300 and you see the women in that mountain who they go to get prophecies from. Mm. Do you know that even mm. Alexander the Great went to get prophecies from this woman? The, these were flowing powerfully in the prophetic but using <laughs> divination wow. Look or the that. Pythian spirit, which is the Python spirit. So that girl was part of that order. They, they, they would get these virgin girls who would be dedicated to running. So they had an order of oracles. That's what they were called, oracles. Yeah. And so you see that a problem in the Corinthian Roman setup. Yeah. So, so they would be adorned in jewelry with their hair and, and, and they'd be makeup and they would be, you know, speaking and prophesying or whatever it is. Mm. And they were also temple prostitutes. So that was a serious cultural problem. And so that's why Paul says, let your women be quiet and speak to their own husbands. Mm. Okay. So that's the historical that, context. That, that makes sense. Oh, yes. But then somebody said, no, these <laughs> women can't speak. <laughs> we, like, like you wonder where these seven daughters of Philip were prophesying if they were not speaking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like, like where were they speaking? And then mm. John, who's John addressing in third John? Mm. Esteemed, most esteemed high lady yeah. and the people in your home. Mm. Not Actually, church, even, even you know. Paul in, in Timothy refers to women with great yes, faith. Yes, yes. Yeah. And a lot of them, are Aquila and Priscilla, a good example. Yeah. Priscilla yeah. and Aquila. And, and it even says Priscilla and Aquila. It's like Priscilla was so prominent that Aquila is like an afterthought. The, the, <laughs> it's like the way he says, I will pray in the spirit and pray my understanding also. Ah, so the spirit is more yes. prominent. So, so you, know, you know the law of first mention? So Priscilla yes. gets mentioned more first every time those two names are dropped. Yeah. And so meaning Priscilla was very influential, but she was a woman. Mm. So in the Old Testament, Deborah and a number of very key women were very critical in, in, the, in, the, in the course of Israeli history. So, so to say women should not speak and all that, you know, is, is a bit of a stretch. Yeah. It, 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 is, it, it doesn't really hold water if you really take the Bible and scrutinize it thoroughly. Mm. So, so that's the issue. So coming back now. So we, the Bible tells us. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Pause. Yeah. Right there. That's your narration. And we have no idea mm. how long it that took. was. In uh, fact, yeah, my, yeah. my colleague and I and a number of us in this school actually speculate with a lot of authority to say that this could be literally millions of years. And we say so because when you begin to study the accounts of Lucifer and that angelic hierarchy and what's going on in that space, you realize that the Bible doesn't tell us in Genesis where these creatures come from, come from yeah. but they're all over. Yeah. There's, there's angels, there's cherubim, seraphim, thrones, you know, dominions, all sorts of creatures going on, archangels, mm. you name it. They are all there. And, and, and in the book of Job, when God questions uh, Job in verse, chapter 38, verse, I think, 5 and 6, he says, where were you when I was stretching out the plumb line of the earth and setting it in place? Mm -hmm. When the stars yeah. cheered and yeah. sang on and celebrated the witness of the birth of the earth. So these beings were already there. When we go to Ezekiel 28, we hear about um, uh, Lucifer and the description of the king of Tyre, who, by the way, when those scriptures are coming up, you realize that it, it speaks in a dual sense. In the one sense, it speaks of a physical of king a physical on king. earth, yeah. but in, a, in another sense, it also speaks of a spiritual authority or entity in the spirit realm. We see that in Daniel 10, when he talks about the prince of Persia, yeah. who withstood the angel of God. So there was a Gabriel. powerful, mighty angel, Gabriel, coming, yeah. and he could not... So his rank was lower than this particular angel. So that he could not contend with this angel until a higher ranking angel, i.e. Michael, came and contended. And we know these ranks are so serious because in the book of Jude, Michael and Lucifer are literally contending for the body of Moses yeah. and neither can rebuke the other. Yeah. And so Michael has to call on a higher authority, the Lord, the Lord himself, God, <laughs> Jesus, yeah. rebuke you. And so on that account, then obviously Lucifer had to yield because there's a very serious hierarchy of laws and order in that kingdom. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a very interesting picture. And we begin to see that there's a narrative which we don't hear. Yet you come to verse 2. 
Very strange. It says, and the earth was without form and void. Let me read the whole of it and then I'm going to start to break it down. Okay. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Three things that are inexplicable based on this account. Number one, where did the darkness come from? Because God created everything. So if he created everything, where did the darkness come from? Where did the deep come from? And where did the water come from? Mm, mm. So that's where now, you know, you have to look at the term used, the, 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 this, uh, this term here, without form and void. Without There's another void. place where it also occurs. Very interestingly, yeah. in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, this is what the Bible says. It says, I beheld the earth and indeed it was without form and void. Those words again. Yeah. And the heavens, they had no light. There's yeah. the darkness again. You see? Yeah. I beheld the mountains and indeed they trembled and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld it indeed there was no man. Yeah. So this is a very interesting account. And the Hebrew words are tohu and bohu. Mm. And those words tohu and bohu relate to desolation. Mm. Desolation by its very nature cannot occur on something that didn't exist before. Yes. Desolation refers to ruins and destruction. So meaning there's something and then it's destroyed. Mm. And what we see, a very interesting term, which comes from what we call natural law or hermetic law, the order out of chaos. We mm. see that mm. right there in chapter three, in chapter one, verse three. Yes. Because then God says, and let there be light. So God begins to create a whole reality out of the disorder. Yeah. And then it goes even further to say that he separates the light from the darkness. So for those of us who've been studying this for a while, we believe there's two realms right there that were formed, the realm of darkness and the realm of light. So the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Of light. So these, these manifest in the ruins that are at that verse one, chapter one, verse two. And so the question, where was the water from? So I, we, 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 we first had to look, one has to simply take a look at evidence. Is there evidence on the earth to suggest the literal six days? Or is there evidence on the earth to suggest the millions of years? It's you know, a just, very big just a, a side thought on that particular matter of mm. the duration of uh, uh, when the duration of the creation of the heavens and the earth. I know it's a, it, it may be a, a little bit, <laughs> but Touching. you know, yeah. Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Mm -hmm. I go that I may prepare a place. A place. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing a study of the scriptures and I was studying the book of Corinthians. And Paul says, for those of you who ask, when we are resurrected, what kind of bodies will we have? Mm -hmm. He says, you're foolish. Because don't you know that what you plant in the ground is a seed? But the seed does not always produce itself. It produces something different. You know, when you want uh, an orange, the seed is small. Yes. But what it produces is an orange. It's an orange. Within so it is everything it needs to become an orange. Yes. So Paul is saying the bodies you have now may not be what you have. Because what, you, what is planted in the earth when you're buried is not necessarily what may come out. Now, interesting enough, Jesus also referred to the bodies as houses. Yes. He said, when you want to... Um, go into a strong man's house and plunder his goods. Don't you bind the strong man first? That's right. And he also says when you cast out devils and uh, they go and f come back and find that the house is clean, they call seven more wicked than, wicked themselves. than themselves. So Jesus constantly referred to the body as a house. That's right. Paul refers to the body as a as temple a and as a house. Mm -hmm. And um, he says, in my father's house, there are many, there are many mansions. mansions. It makes me think, mm -hmm. What are these mansions Jesus is talking about? Mm -hmm. What exactly has he gone to prepare yes. in heaven? Mm -hmm. Is it bodies? And well, it's, it's difficult to say. It's difficult <laughs> to say. But you know what I believe? Yeah. I believe, and again, we're jumping the gun here. I believe that when Adam was created, he had the body that Jesus has now. Mm. Adam was created perfect. He, he, he was the ultimate being okay when we when we ask the question is there historical evidence within nature 
to suggest that the earth is 8,000 years old. Okay, let's stretch it. 8,000 years old, or is it older? Well, the truth of the matter is that archaeological evidence is there that the earth is older than anything we can imagine. And, yeah. and uh, of course, the argument then immediately comes up and says, okay, but if it's older, then uh, what about the apparent you know, effect of aging, because that's the argument that's been used by a number of uh, theologians that, no, we, you know, God created the earth with the apparent effect of aging. And so he gives two, and they give two really good arguments. Number one, Adam was created an adult and all the animals were created adults. So not created yeah, babies. Yeah, yeah. And then number two, the other, so they come with an apparent age, right? Yes. And then the second one is the story of Jesus and the, and the wine. Uh, he, he immediately says, you know, and then it's it's cured. It's Lord of a time. You know what yeah. I mean? Huh? Yeah, like like wow. Even the MC goes, "Hey, this is powerful stuff." Yeah, yeah. 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 So meaning it it had that effect of aging instantaneously. So yes, God is able to do that. But then, when we come to this very problematic verse one, verse two, chapter one, verse two, we we have to pause because we see things in there. And when we start to dip all over scripture, we start to see evidence to suggest that. No, there was something going on much longer. I'm going to read something for you that you've never seen before. Okay. Genesis 1. Okay, you have seen it, but <laughs> you've not heard it in the light I'm about to throw right here in this presentation today. Okay. I want you to see this. You see, God uh, has just come from, you know, flooding the earth and killing every creature accordingly. Yeah. And so now he, 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 he allows everybody to come out of the ark and, and then he makes a statement. Listen to his statement. He says, verse 21, And the Lord smelt a soothing aroma when they you know, did the offering. Yeah. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I ever again destroy every living thing as I've done through a flood. Now, that's so interesting because in the beginning, we thought it was one. But then let's go back to verse one, chapter one, verse two. Mm. Where is the water that the, the, the spirit of God is hovering over? Where did that come from? Mm. So our, our, our uh, postulation is that that water is part of the first destruction that took place. There was a huge war that took place and there's so much evidence to suggest this but let's go first back to this evidence on the earth we have evidence of dinosaurs you cannot argue with dinosaurs they are there you just have to go to a history museum a proper one in the uk or us or wherever and you see the bones and, yeah. and you can argue with that it's right there and they can radiocarbon date them and tell you this thing is five hundred thousand years old this one is two million years old that one is 60 million years old and and you know you can argue all you want but it's in your face so, yeah. so, so you have to come to this acceptance. And then the irony is that dragons are, sorry, uh, uh, dinosaurs are mentioned in the Bible, just people don't realize it. The mm. word dragon, the word Leviathan are all examples of dinosaurs. Mm. But here's what's even more interesting. You, you, you find in all this evidence, something profound. There was found a sediment on which there's a footprint of a brontosaurus. Brontosaurus was the biggest occurring animal in, in, in that era, in terms of a dinosaur. Very massive, massive creature. Yeah. And uh, very, very big. And next to the footprint of the brontosaurus is the footprint of a man. And mm. when that, that uh, uh, sediment was you know, radiocarbon dated, it's 200,000 years old. Mm. 200,000 years years old. Now, the implication of that is that at least Homo habilis, I don't know about Homo sapiens, but yeah. Homo habilis existed 200,000 years ago. And so we realize that in the celestials, there was this existence and we know Christ was the preeminent center of it all. So in fact, our view for those of us that subscribe to the kingdom of God is a Christocentric view. Christ is the center of everything. Mm. But what you will realize is that when Adam, sorry, when uh, Lucifer rebels, which we'll get into, he then targets Adam and I'll come to that. So in that beginning, there was Christ as the king, as the center, as the master of the universe, together with Elion, the most high God, the ancient of days, the father of creation. So Christ was his, 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 his uh, what you call visible manifest 
uh, entity yeah. in the Trinity. And so with that, Christ created the entire hierarchy of these beings. And if you want to see that, Colossians 1, 15 to 17 really nails it. So let me, let me read that for you because, you know, again, our theology is a bit messed up. And so some people think that this is not true. So the preeminence of Christ, it's even called the preeminence of Christ, the whole yeah, topic, but yeah. I'm not going to read everything. <laughs> I'll just go to 15. Listen to what he says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of our all creation, for by him all things were created that are in the heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible. And then listen to this. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Wait a minute. Where, where do we see that? Ephesians chapter Ephesians, 6. Exactly. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Where yes. we say we do not wrestle against, against flesh and blood. Exactly. But so, so, yeah. so, so two of these are mentioned there as well. All things were created through him and for him. Wow. <laughs> so that's one of the passages I'm doing a series called How Real Satanism, What Real Satanism Looks Like. And I'm really trying to show that these hidden natural laws that people talk about were originally created by God. There is no dark power that created anything. Yeah. All the laws were created by God. All that happens is that when man fell, because of his evil, God had to restrict certain knowledge from him. And then the Luc Lucifer and his angels, in their, cunning, in their cunning, then went and taught man secretly these forbidden arts, knowing very well that they've given a razor blade to a child. Would, would you, you know, the, the Bible in the book of Ephesians talks about something interesting. It says, uh, this is my favorite scripture, by the way. If you guys ever do Bible study, if you study the Bible in your own time, you should practice this. I do this every time I'm reading the Bible. I pray this prayer that Paul prayed, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in Correct. the knowledge of God. Correct. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Then he further, at the end of that chapter, talks about how he has he will reveal the wisdom of God mm -hmm. and the hidden mysteries Correct. to the principalities through the church. And me, that's one I quote all the time. I always say the difference between the occult and magic yeah. and the kingdom of God is that the mysteries hidden in occult are revealed in Christ. So meaning yeah. as we grow in Christ, these mysteries begin to be, no, 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 that's the wrong word. They've already been revealed. We just need to access them. Mm. So, so, and because we do it in Christ, ours is a different motive. Ours is a different end. Mm. But the, but those who operate in the realm of the kingdom of darkness do it for control. And because Lucifer knows the evil hearts of men, he has put this as bait so that it is man centered. You see, it's, it, Lucifer points it all to self. Mm. God Need, requires it to point to him. That's mm. always the difference. The war always is an apotheocentric view versus a Christocentric view. So believers and kingdom people, it's Christocentric. It's always about God and the glory of God. Mm. Whereas man and all the Luciferianism, Satanism, and all these funny things, it's about man. Because mm. Lucifer wants man to, 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 to become partners with him so that he can usurp physical rulership of this earth. He can't rule right now. Mm. He's not permitted to. Mm. So he has to rule through people. But coming back, because we keep drifting, uh, apologies. <laughs> coming back to this particular chapter here, one verse one, verse two, chapter one, verse two. So we see that there's a whole hierarchy of all these powerful beings, yeah. powerful beings. And uh, they are ruling. And then according to Ezekiel 28 and according to Isaiah 14, something went wrong uh, and, and pride was found in the heart of uh, Lucifer and he decided to literally stage a coup d'etat, mm. uh, which didn't work. So in the process, there was a war. Now, what's so interesting, and this is the part I want people to take note of. Do you see God in that war? No. Do you see Jesus in that war? No. There you go. So this is a war between factions, literal factions. The factions for El Elyon, the factions against El Elyon. Mm. And scripture teaches clearly that the factions against are defeated spectacularly. Okay. Mm. Now this defeat seems not to have extended to total annihilation, mm. but banishment. Mm. So when you read the book of 
Ezekiel chapter number 28, verse 14, group 15, 16, 17. It's very interesting because you see a narration about the king of Tyre and you see a narration about the fact that he was a very powerful being. He moved between the fiery stones. For yeah. me, I postulate that that's actually interstellar travel. That's uh, interplanetary travel that was going on in those realms. Is that what they, you know, the scientists talk about the black holes? Yeah, saying, all this. If, yes. you, if you really get into a black hole, you could find yourself in an alternate in an alternate universe or whatever you want to call it. Fine, but for me, there was definitely interstellar travel. Mm. You can pick it from what is being written there. There, mm -hmm. there was at least interplanetary wow. travel. Wow. So, but what's even? And you know why I say so? Because when you now go outside to extra biblical sources now, yeah, like let's go for example to the Sanskrit writings, the narration of the Sanskrit, they describe vehicles that fly, they describe vehicles that shoot fire, which sounds like nuclear bombs. <laughs> they are right there. It's not something that I'm making up. You can go read yeah. it and go, whoa. And, and, and then, I mean, uh, Ezekiel and Enoch have the most awesome descriptions of some of these vehicles that show up. Yeah, Ezekiel describes a, a chariot. Oh, the chariot the with chariot wheels within with wheels, uh, eyes, yes, and all sorts of yes. things going on, and the Ancient of Days in there. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, whichever way you look at it, this is a man trying to, to describe what sounds like a spaceship. Yeah. I, I'm not saying it is. Yeah. But, but that description is absolutely mind-blowing. And he's trying to use words from that time. Oh, by the way, as he described that vision, he said, and the hand pulled me by a lock of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> like that, absolutely. No, all these old prophets actually kept locks. Yes. People don't know that. <laughs> they did. From, so they were Nazarenes, so they yes. kept locks. Uh, yes. John the Baptist, uh, Samson, the Essenes, the, the Qumran community, all these um, mystics of that time, um, mystics of schools of obviously, you know, Judaism at a deeper level, they all uh, never comb their hair, they never cut their hair. Mm. So that's where the locks come from, that's where the Rastafarians kind of get it from, but it won't go there. We've, we've styled it, now we spray, we even spray <laughs> oils. You even cut the sides, you're not supposed to cut anything. It's supposed to be locks, you know? <laughs> Something had seven locks, yes, you know that, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> so, so, so you find that this, 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 strange interplanetary inter vehicular technology was there. Yeah. And what's even more interesting is that we are told that God destroyed Rahab, one of the fiery stones. Mm. I have this theory that I think asteroid is a destroyed planet. Like literally the asteroid belt mm. in the solar system is a destroyed planet. I think that may have been the habitation of, of, of uh, Lucifer mm. as a prince back in the day. The Bible tells us that he was seen by men. Now, now that's so interesting, you know, because we're like, is it a future event? Is it a past Yeah, you, you know, like, for example, the Bible says they will look narrowly yes. and say, isn't he is the, the one, one that shook nations? Yes, both in Revelation and in Ezekiel. It's yes. Mentioned. And so you begin to ask yourself, wait a minute. Is this a past event? Is this a future event? But then again, Jesus... On, in his ministry on earth, after he sends out the 70 and they come back with the report, he says, and I saw Satan fall like lightning. Mm. Now, who is who is known as the God of lightning? Uh, Zeus. Thor and oh, Zeus. Oh, Thor yeah, and Zeus. Yeah, both, yeah. Both, yeah. yeah. And who's the light bearer? Lucifer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so it's so interesting. So you begin to ask, us, where are these events happening? Are they futuristic? Are they past? Are they present? We postulate in my in my in my uh, studies, my, myself and a good friend of mine, we postulate it as they are mentioned in scripture. So this Genesis one two is a real event. There's a real war that took place, and this war sees the total cataclysmic destruction of the earth. Yeah, the earth is completely destroyed, and it is then flooded. So there are two floods in short. Yeah. So that's why mm. we see the verse ending with the spirit of the Lord hovered upon the waters because mm. the Bible doesn't tell us how the water was created. It just shows us there. Yes, there was already water. There was already darkness. water. And yeah. so what starts to happen now? Now he starts to do this whole creation again. He starts to speak into, into this earth setup in this, in, in this um, not necessarily the universe, but into this, this realm, which we're going to call for argument's sake, the solar system, but specifically the earth sphere mm. because he speaks to the water and the water separates. It divides, yeah. So you have the water in the upper firmament, water in the lower firmament. And I'm, mixed, I'm mentioning this because I want to demonstrate something very interesting. 
this water in the upper firmament becomes some kind of shield. Mm. And there's a whole bunch of people who argue about the flat earth. I deeply disagree with the flat earth theory. For, for great, I can give you 50,000 reasons why the flat earth theory is nonsensical. But that aside, let's, let's stick with the argument because we'll drift away. Yeah. That, that, that layer of water that was above the earth, mm. people say, ah, but then where's that water? Duh, the flood of Noah. Ah, it had never rained on the earth. It had never rained. You see? It had never rained on the earth. So, so there had to be, when this event took place and God decides to destroy, the waters of heaven now poured. So water used to come from the ground to water yeah, the earth. Actually, the Bible does say that in Genesis. Yes. It says there was no man to till, therefore the land, water came from. Water came from yeah, the ground. Yeah, so yeah. this is a very interesting scenario. So we see a cataclysmic, cosmic level mm. destruction going on in Genesis 1, 2. Yeah. And it is at that point where it seems, again, that's highly speculative, but it seems that Lucifer was then confined to a certain realm within the universe of creation, but not necessarily, uh, for lack of a better word, not necessarily cast. In fact, there's a very false narrative that the Satan is in hell. That's nonsensical. Yeah, He's not yeah. there. So he is in the realm. And so in that realm where he was, together with where all the angels are, is the ethereal realm. So this ethereal realm or the ether, ether plane or the astral plane is one of the planes that when, when Adam was created, he was able to see into all these realms and to interact at all those realms. He had the capacity in terms of his creative uh, sense to see into that. What you and I call the sixth sense, Adam, mm. that was normal. The Bible says Adam heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. So it's, it's, he probably had a higher sense of uh, perception beyond our five senses. Absolutely. In fact, what we call the sixth sense for Adam, yeah. that was normal. <laughs> and it goes third beyond eye. even the sixth sense. So does that mean he had the third eye, which is obviously the pineal gland. He, he had the ability to see sound and hear light. Mm. He had the ability to sense all around his environment. So that meant... He could see into the multiple layers of what is the fabric of space and time. Mm. And that's why he could name animals mm. without a second thought. Mm. Um, there are those who speculate that he could touch the ground and he could, he could listen to trees. He, he could hear the earth. Mm. It's really deep stuff. You know, when you go to the Gnostics, they teach that. But the truth is that was the Adamic state before the fall. Before the fall. Yeah. And he could manipulate nature. He could, he could transmute, he could walk through, well, he could be anywhere. In fact, <laughs> the obsession with superheroes is us remembering Adam. Adam. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's where it comes from. And so when Adam comes in the picture, there's already this cataclysmic war at play. So the pre-Adamic people were the ones that were destroyed with that first cataclysm. We know because we have evidence in various scripture. We've already given several where Lucifer himself mm. was, was, was captured and banished. Yeah. Now, even though he was banished, when you go deeper to study, you begin to see that there's multiple levels of banishment. Mm. So it's not like that's it. Lucifer is exiled. Technically, no, because you study the Bible, you start to see Satan appear several times. Even in the, in presence, the presence of God. Of God yeah. 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 So, so, so that again now brings into question, okay, wait a minute. This is supposed to be. And then, you know, one of, one of the other things is that um, the kingdom of God is very interesting. It's a kingdom. So if you see a kingdom on earth, that's the parallel. Mm. Mm. And one of the most interesting components, and let, let's close with this, is that that kingdom has a king. It has a court, it has judges, yes. it has officers, and most interesting, it has a host of armies. Executioners. Yes. <laughs> so now the question is, why does God need a standing army? Mm. Answer, because they enforce the law, the spiritual law of the kingdom. Wow. So that's where it all starts. So when yeah. we come back, we're going to study, because there's one component that's so interesting about uh, uh, about. Uh, Eden, and I'll leave this with your, your viewers. Yeah. This will blow their mind. When Adam falls, and by the way, 
A lot of people say, why did Eve talk to the snake? No, no, no. She, they talked to animals. That's what people don't understand. They mm. already spoke with animals. These animals could talk to them. They were much, much higher in their, in their transcendence as beings. Mm. They were literally like gods. Just a little lower than the Elohim, but they mm. were literally like gods. So the, it's very naive to make a statement like, why is she talking to a, to a snake? And the snake is talking <laughs> dumb. They talked to animals. So they talked to trees. They talked to the earth. They talked to the sky. This went on. Mm. And people think the idea of talking to the earth sounds strange. I quote Jeremiah for you. Earth, earth, here, now. And God speaks to the earth. Mm. You see? So, and, and there's scriptures which say, let the earth be witness mm. of this blood. And then you've got scriptures that say, and the blood called out from the earth. Yes. So, so people have to understand that every element God created has a sound. It has, it has life. Yeah. Mm. And so we call that harmonics, but that's a topic for another day. So let's come back to, to Eve. And I want to leave this with you. So they fall, right? They, they, they listen. To the, we'll talk about that in, in our next one. And then they fall. Now, when they fall, the Bible tells us a cherub with a flaming sword is sent to the tree of life to guard the entrance. And this sword went back and forth and no one could access the tree of life. Now, that's interesting because I want to ask you a question. Had Adam already lost his godlike status? Do you agree? When he fell? Mm. He had lost it, right? Yeah, he had. So if Adam has lost his godlike status, which means he's even less powerful than he was, mm. why would God send the most powerful ranking angel? Cherub and seraphim are the highest ranking angels. Why would God send a cherub to guard a tree against the man? Answer, no, he did not send it to guard a tree against the man. He sent it to guard the tree against other cherubs and seraphs and that's a topic for another day so we want yeah. to come back and tackle part two of that <laughs> thank you rev um this was part one of uh, the pre-adamic world this was an introduction to the pre-adamic world we still have a lot to discuss rev will be back in studio soon um if you're not subscribed please subscribe hit that bell and share for now it's bye bye hey like what you see i know you do hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell Ciao!